the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course I should have played this. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, The Quad, Empire, and Marvel's The Punisher, writer and executive producer, Felicia D. Henderson. Why I find it interesting that family dramas or, or dramas or comedies about life are so hard to sell. You know, they're always like, what's the engine? executives will ask and you're like the engine is life you never run out of stories because you're just telling the story of life in this episode writer and producer felicia d henderson on her 25-year television career which includes family matters soul food Sister, sister in the quad henderson discusses navigating the shift from writer to showrunner finding inspiration in everyday life, and exploring relationships through film. I'm curious to know how you went from majoring in psychobiology uh, and getting an MBA in corporate finance mm -hmm. to writing for television. Isn't that the, the, the way everyone gets into television? <laughs> um, truly, as the rest of my life, you know, it has always been a series of fortunate events blessings, right place, the right time, um, and getting into television is no different. So that, you know, I was working in corporate finance and, um, you know, my boss said, uh, you, if you're going to stay here, you really should get an MBA. So I said, okay. And I thought at that time, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work in corporate finance. That's what I was doing. And um, so I had to start looking for money you know, to be able to go to grad school. And um, I saw that the um, Peabody Foundation and NBC together had this wonderful fellowship that basically was a full ride um, at the University of Georgia, so I applied. But it was for people getting their MBAs who were interested in management in television, which I had never considered. But suddenly, I wrote a really impressive essay about how that's all I'd ever wanted to do. <laughs> And so I got the fellowship. I should have known then maybe, like, I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> so I got the fellowship um, at the University of Georgia. And because I got that fellowship and NBC partially paid for it, um, it allowed me then to apply for the management training program at NBC. And it was once I was there, um, part of the job was in New York. And then you spent part of the time in the business side in New York, and then part of the time in Burbank on the creative side. So when I got to the Burbank side, it was my first exposure to scripts. And um, it was there where uh, one of my bosses told me about the Warner Brothers Writers Workshop and said that I should apply. Mostly based on you give great notes, you have great story sense, and I'd never written a script in my life. And I wrote. I wrote a Roseanne from the original Roseanne, because um, it was my favorite show at the time. And I got into that program. So um, from there, I have literally been writing ever since. From that program, they placed me as an apprentice on Family Matters, better known as the Urkel Show. So <laughs> that was my first job ever, um, was, was writing Urkel jokes. It was adapted from George Tillman's film, Soul Food, and this was also the first show that you created, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, how did that come about? Okay, so that came about because when I was a student in MFA in um, screenwriting at UCLA, 
um, I won the screenwriting contest. And I won it with a family drama that was loosely based on my own family. And one of the judges for that happened to be the head of drama development at Paramount TV, right when they were getting into a partnership with Showtime to adapt Soul Food. So the woman, um, her name's Kathy Ling, um, asked, you know, can I meet with this writer? Because it's all anonymous, you know, so can I have her name and meet with her? And they said, of course. She got my name. And I was, um, you know, working on Paramount's show at the time, eventually got an overall deal at Paramount. So she's like, this can't be. Her name is Felicia Henderson. There's already a Felicia Henderson that we work with who's a comedy writer. And, you know, what a coincidence. <laughs> and so she learned, no, that I am the same Felicia Henderson. But I met with her, then I met with the president of Showtime. And, um, you know, and he said, well, you've never done a drama what makes you qualified, you know, to write this drama about three sisters? And I said, I have five sisters. <laughs> and he's like, okay, you're hired. <laughs> this is Big Mama's house, or at least that's what we still call it. Because even though she left us five months ago, the family still gathers here every Sunday for fried chicken, collard greens, black eyed peas, cornbread, and any kind of pie you can think of. Yes, ma'am. Everybody's trying my cornbread. Mama, can I go to the mall? All right, child. The series opens uh, five months after the Joseph sisters' mother has died. Mm -hmm. And what was your process in figuring out that that's where you wanted to start this series? I think that um, there were lots of thoughts and lots of cooks in the kitchen. And I think one of the things that was most important to me and why I find it interesting that family dramas or, or dramas or comedies about life are so hard to sell, you know, they're always like, what's the engine, executives will ask. And you're like, the engine is life. You never run out of stories because you're just telling the story of life. But it's hard for executives to get that. Um, so I always knew we'd have plenty of story from these three women's lives. But the mother character the, the, that you speak of that, you know, she died in the movie was such one. I love the actress, Irma P. Hall, and I wanted to find a way to keep her. And I wanted to find a way to keep the process of grieving for one's mother alive in the series. So that was why so soon after her death, like five months after, and why then I created these sort of visions, if you will, of her, where they could talk to her and where the grandson, Ahmad, had a relationship with his dead grandmother, basically, where she would come and visit him when he needed her most, because I wanted to keep that actress still involved, and I wanted them to still have a relationship with her, um, even though the character had passed away. I miss you, Mama. Really? I don't miss you at all. Because <laughs> I'm always with you. <laughs> and birds start wearing your skirts a little longer. You somebody's mama now. I'm from a very big, crazy family. So I also, I have a nephew who was raised by my mom. So a lot of that relationship that Ahmad was going to have with Big Mama was very much based on the relationship that my nephew had with my mother as well. What were the storylines and topics that you knew very early on that you wanted to explore? I mean, I think with you know every show you're running, you try to start at the beginning of the season at least, arcing out the whole season. Like, here's where we're going to start, and here's where we want to end. And then everything in between has to get you there. So I think that, um, again, a lot for me for that particular show uh, came from my experience. I have a sister who suffers horribly with anxiety disorder. So I knew that I wanted to, and has gone through a lot because of it. So I knew that I wanted one of my characters in a very real way to um, be grappling with how to live your life and, and while you're grappling with um, severe anxiety disorder. You all right, Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I, I have to leave a message. I have reservations for two this afternoon, and I'm running a little late. Hello? Hello? Is anybody there? Are we okay? I'm fine. Ma'am? Thank you. Thanks. Stay. 
Carrie Joseph. I have two o'clock reservation, and I'm running 20 minutes late. Thank you. So a lot of that kind of stuff I um, put in that I knew that I can't be the only one who has experienced this, you know. Um, and then, of course, I have a writing staff. That's the beauty of a writing staff. And purposely trying to hire people with different points of view than I had and different family experiences than I had. But I certainly got to the point in my family where we'd be talking about something and, you know, one of my sisters would just stop. Like, this is not for the show, you know, they would say, say to me sometimes. So, um, because I would, I would be like, really? It all felt very personal and uh, specific. Yeah, I mean, I think because, again, I'm, you know, I'm one of eight kids, and so I feel like I've been studying siblings my whole life. And, um, and as a kid, I was the quiet one because I was always watching and listening and studying that I'm most, most interested in the moments between the scenes, as, as you just said. Um, I'm most interested in my youngest brother, who's you know, now in his late 30s, um, who's a father with four kids. And, but our dynamics are, he's still you know, a guy with six sisters who tell him what to do. Like, that's not gonna really change. It was the first show since A Different World that was dedicated to the culture of historically black colleges mm -hmm. and universities. And could you take us through the, the inspiration uh, that you had for it and yes. the steps in creating the story? Yeah, sure. It um, was one that came to me a little differently because um, Rob Hardy, who directed the pilot as one of the executive producers, um, came to me and said, you know, he wanted to do such a show and had been talking to BET about doing such a show. And I had been talking about to BET about doing a show. And so when we talked and had breakfast, I said, well, he originally had kind of a different way to go about it and um, that I wasn't as interested in. But I said, what I am interested in, because it was right after when we first had our first conversations, after um, Hillary's first run for president. And I was very interested in exploring, you know, a woman in a man's world, a woman at the top of the food chain in a man's world. And the, what I knew about Hillary's campaign and all of the tiny little details of why you gotta switch to pantsuits and, you know, being worried about sitting in chairs like this and skirts, like little things like that, and yet you're just supposed to be there just to share your ideas. So I, that's what I was interested in. If I could make, if I could explore a woman being the president of a historically black university that had never had a woman in any position of power, that would be interesting to me. My ability to survive and my intellect are both very black, Mr. Diamond. My point is simple. I don't answer to you, and I never will. My point is simple as well. You do as I asked you, or I will not hesitate to put my foot directly in your ass. That black enough for you? And so that's what we took into BET, and they bought it. Um, and it was a lot of fun to develop, because in some ways it was like, if you could create your own college, you know, that was the experience. Like, I got to choose what my college colors would be. Like, I never thought of all of those things when we were developing. Like, I get to choose what the mascot will be. And all of those things, and you know, what will the sorority, what will be the Greek letters of every sorority and fraternity? Those were all the decisions that, when you're saying, I'm gonna create a show on a college campus, you're not thinking about. So there were lots of long days um, just creating what would be what would be the college campus, let alone what the stories <laughs> would be. That's all before stories were ever you know were ever done. But it was um, from that point of view it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, and also discovering new talent. That's one of my favorite things. Just really talented people who are just getting their main their their first big um, breaks. I love that. I love the doctor. Eva Fletcher, the president, um, that she also doesn't have a history with mm -hmm. HBCUs, and this is her first time, so we get, like, she is the fish out of water here. Right, she's our introduction to it, right? And I think that um, my experience is that I have a niece and a nephew, um, both 
um, who were both educated at HBCUs. So my experience is that I have paid for HBCU educations. So, but um, I really wanted her to be, you know, the show in some ways be for everyone who didn't go to an HBCU to experience it. So it became important to bring her from the North having never experienced this. The second part is because we wanted to explore all kinds of thinking about what blackness is. And, um, and that she comes in thinking this is gonna be fine because I'm black and it's a historically black university and you know they immediately um, call her Black Ivy because she went she was educated at Ivy League schools and she's not one of them and she didn't expect that so I wanted to explore a bit of that as well so those are the two reasons to bring her to make her from somewhere else to make her such an outsider her black skin don't make her black not black black not not running a black university black Frat, I've been listening to you and moan for two hours. What's your plan? Oh, oh I got a good plan. I'm resigning. Already wrote the letter. Hey, you know the worst part? Mm. They'll call me to clean up Black Ivy's mess when she fails. You start with her, and then how do you decide how to fill out the rest of your cast? And I mean, this is just using the quad as a case study. Yeah. But for any TV show, filling in who they're going to be bouncing off against. Yeah, I think that in a general, general way, it is about conflict. So you know, I mean, I always like, okay, what world am I going to be living in? In that, in that case, the world of the HBCU. And then, you know, what person absolutely doesn't belong there? Whatever the world is going to be. Or if you start with a character, where would be the place most full of conflict to put that character? in terms of what world that you want them to end up in. And that's for everything that I do, I think. Um, and then it's still about conflict as you, um, you know, build out the world. And so obviously it's an HBCU, you're going to have a band director, right? Um, and so because of that, now you ask, well then what is her relationship gonna be with the band director? Because band directors, you know, are kings on most of these uh, campuses. And if that's the case, then how, where is the built-in natural grounded conflict between Eva and the band director? Um, and so that's really what you try to do is build out a world that gives you about a million kinds of conflict for that character, for your main character, after putting them in a world that by its very nature um, is going to be one that they're gonna have challenges in. No matter what that is, if you go back to soul food, um, making the oldest sister, Terry, the character who, even though it's a family drama, everything about it is conflict for Terry, who is the one of these things that's not like the others, because she is you know, the most educated, because she's the most intelligent, because she's the most ambitious, because she doesn't look like any of her, her other two sisters. All of that means everything about her world is going to be about conflict. And then put her, you know, this very, very accomplished woman in a relationship with like a FedEx guy, right? So it's always about trying to find ways to fill their worlds with, with dramatic conflict. And you also deal with a lot of hot topics. Um, there's, you know, hazing, sexual assault, economic uh, inequality, cyberbullying, mm -hmm. um, police brutality. Did you, did you ever get any pushback from BET or requests to temper anything? Always. <laughs> um, it's sort of the challenge, you know, if you're not on premium cable. And it's, it's complicated, you know, because you're on black entertainment television. So you think if there's any place where you're going to be able to really dig in, right, and really go for it, that's where, but that's not the case. It really is still a very conservative place that still feels a bit of the, well, if we're the most well-known black channel, there's things that we don't want to say or do. And that was my experience quite often. But it still stings that they canceled that show after two seasons because we were sort of just getting started and um, you know it wasn't ever really properly marketed. 
the first season of the show, you know, where we had a season long arc of the uh, date rape of a, a young woman by a football player. And, you know, he's the most popular, but I really wanted to do two explorations. One of, you know, I had just seen the O.J. Simpson documentary. <laughs> So I was obsessed with this idea of, you know, how that person is made. If people uh, worship you from the time you're nine or 10 because you can throw a ball, then you never have to develop as a whole human. So it's sort of the making of a psychopath in a way or a sociopath um, because you never had any reason to become a full person um, thanks to society worshiping what you do well. And um, so I didn't want to paint, you know, the rapist as just, oh, he's the bad guy rapist, nor did I want to do what network television often does with a victim, is they're used just to tell the story of how they caught, you know, the, the perpetrator, but wanted to equally take a look at both of their stories so that you could just see what, for both of them. And um, so that was, very, I'm very proud of that, that at the end, you know, by the end of the season and as I started to visit um, HBCUs on behalf of the show to, you know, have a young woman come up to me and say that she finally talked about or reported, you know, being raped because she saw that show. So you think about it like that, it's like, wow, if that happened for one person, then it was worth all the hell that I went through uh, to try to tell that story, um, to try to tell that story accurately. So that season in particular, I'm very proud of because it really resonated with a lot of people, including athletes who were like, thank you for not just, you know, depicting him as a, you know, as a jerk who thought, well, I should be able to, like he had a moment where he's like, did I rape her? Like he didn't even, you know, realize it. So, um, but eventually did, but, so I'm proud of that season, but it also represents a lost battle because the original end of it was that um, he was going to go to campus when he's kicked off the team and um, shoot up the campus. And they're like, we cannot depict that at an HBCU. So we'd already shot it though, so it became this really weird episode where he um, commits suicide instead using the existing footage. I want to make sure that we can get the house cool. What is that? Oh, oh that was that was that was that was that was Campus 911. Help! I just walked up the steps and he's just lying there. I think he shot himself. OK, try to calm down. Tell me exactly where you are. Second floor. Johnson Hall. We're sending someone now. We have a male student with what appears to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Do you feel like you have questions that you are continually asking in your shows or in your episodes or through your characters? Yeah. Or do you have any examples of those? Yeah, every character you write should have a bit of you in it because no one can write that like you. Every character, I, run, run, I once wrote a thing about an astronaut and I gave him a horrible fear of flying because no one can talk about fear of flying the way I can. I hate flying. So I'm like, oh, who best to give that to? An astronaut, right? So every character that you write, because people are going to read that and go, oh, that there is a great depth and specificity to that thing because it's coming from inside here. So I try to give, I encourage my students to always do that because you're going to write it so well. And I try to always do that. And then there are, you know, some things that are questions in life that I'm always exploring, that I always want to. I am, my ex-manager pointed this out to me, that in everything I do, no matter if it is comic books, comedies, dramas, features, theater, whatever, there's always a father-daughter relationship. There's always that dynamic, whether it be, whether it be in the workplace, an actual family, wherever, and if it's not there, then I create it. Um, and I didn't know that, but it's true. But I'm raised by my father and had a very strong relationship with my father. So it's not that surprising then. 
even though I didn't realize it, that I'm very interested in that relationship, you know, and exploring that relationship, whether good, bad, or, you know, or very ugly. I'm always interested in that relationship. You've been watching A Conversation with Felicia D. Henderson on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story Project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. See On Story Live? Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers Conference each October. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival.